Joe, for the audience who may not be familiar with you, uh, tell us who you are and what you're up to these days, man. Yeah. So uh, my name is Joe Slecky and uh, I'm a 27 year old, first and foremost, follower of Christ, husband and soon to be father. But my, you know, my career is probably the thing that draws the most eyes and attention um, as I fight for the UFC uh, in the lightweight division, similar to uh, Benil, who you had on. I was actually listening to his episode today, which is funny because uh, he's such a good guy and such a great representative of so many different things. And he fought a friend of mine mm. and it's one of those fights where you're like, Oh man, like it stinks that my buddy had to lose, but what a good guy to go <laughs> represent in the sport. And you're like, outside of that fight, I'm like a big fan of his. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, same occupation, same division, same company. And uh, you know, somebody that I actually very much look up to. Mm. That's funny, man. I, uh, I was telling a buddy yesterday that I, I'm going to like slowly and unintentionally turn into like a UFC podcast. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> that's not my intention, but I just, uh, one, I've always been a fan for a long time. Uh, but then also just with COVID and there are very few sports going on right now. And the UFC dude, it's like every single weekend there are fights on. And so it's kind of, and free fights, you know? So for us fans, it's fun for us to, uh, to watch all that stuff. And, you had a great fight. This uh, just a uh, how long ago was that? Now a couple of weeks. Uh, week today's ago? Friday, so it was eight days ago. Dang, dude. last Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Time's flying. I know. I, I bet. And that was a super impressive win, man. How do you feel just coming off of that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I feel I feel great. I feel super fortunate because, uh, especially with the type of opponent that I had, is like known as making fights very ugly and uh, very long and, and very competitive. You know, if you're winning, even if you're up two to zero you know, going into the third, then you know that he's going to come out absolutely insane in the third. Yeah. And you're probably going to lose the third round or have a very tough third round and get hit and get bloody. And the fact that it went as well as it did, as quick as it did, I could not have felt any more fortunate. And almost like I got away with one. I was super pumped. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at you right now and it does not look like you got in a fight, you know, <laughs> within the last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you came it's away. It's funny because right beforehand, the fight before that got pretty, pretty competitive. And uh, the one girl left on a stretcher, I think just from exhaustion, yeah. And I was walking back from the bathroom and I saw her and I was like, okay, I'm definitely leaving like that tonight. I have to accept that right now. Like win or lose, we're in the hospital post fight and it did not go that way at all. So Dude, yeah, how do you prepare for that? How do you prepare like mentally? That just is like a hurt one. I, I rewatched <laughs> your, I rewatched your fight this week and, uh, and you know, they put all your stats up and you know, your, you know, all, all the stuff there and you, we are the exact same height and the exact same weight and we look nothing alike. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh man, this, this is real embarrassing here. But they'll it, say, you know, 155, but on fight night, I'm at least 165, not 170, 172. Okay. So we rehydrate pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and it's amazing how fast that weight comes off and comes back on. Yeah, absolutely nuts. Uh, it was just very, very fortunate it all went that way. But it's funny enough is when the nerves hit, it's always either like a crowd thing. I'm nervous about the crowd just because I'm not a big, you know, I'm, I'm, my wife is an extrovert. She's like, yeah, she wants to get to know you, know your whole life story right off the bat. Yeah. I am like an introvert. Like I love people. I love getting to know people's backstory and getting to know, know them well, but I can't stand small talk. I can't stand like large crowds of people. It makes me very uncomfortable a lot of times. Yeah. So it's a that, and then B just worried about underperforming. Like I never worry about getting hurt, which is completely backwards. I feel like I should definitely be worried about getting hurt and not what people think, but here we are. How long have you been fighting? How long has this been part of your so, life? Mixed martial arts. I've only been fighting since 2015, but wow. martial arts as a whole in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu since I was six years old. That was like my T-ball. Like I got oh, into it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's almost, you know, it's funny because people will, you know, depending on who you talk to, people will call it luck and fate and all these things. And I always just say like, I can very clearly see like God's hand at work in mm. my life, you know, because all these accidents, you can put in quotes, don't happen. It doesn't happen that way where if you don't meet this person, then your whole life, you know, right. doesn't unfold a certain way. And uh, I was just trying to be a Power Ranger. I was four years old watching the Power <laughs> Rangers. And uh, my brother, I always tell the story, and I'm sure he's tired of hearing it because I paint him in the non-athletic light, but he was playing baseball in the town. Uh, we had just moved to a new town. And my parents would say that, you know, he wasn't getting playing time because of, you know, town politics and stuff. But I like to draw the conclusion that he just wasn't the best athlete. <laughs> and, uh, he was like 10 years old. So they were like, well, maybe we'll try an individual sport. So you want to do karate. We'll, uh, we'll send him. Mm. And if he likes it, then when you're old enough to go to school, you'll, you'll start, you know, I was like, okay, great. 1997. That was. So when I started in 99, jiu-jitsu had really taken, it wasn't very mainstream, you know, mm -hmm. but it had caught on enough to where the instructor had started training and got his blue belt, which is just the second belt that you get in jiu-jitsu. But back then that was enough to teach. And uh, he mm. saw the effectiveness of it. 
and he switched the whole school over to jujitsu. So when I started, oh. you know, my parents probably never would have put me in something as physical as jujitsu, like grappling and you know striking. But because they thought it was going to be traditional martial arts, like karate with more forms and katas and things like that, they were all for it. So it was, mm. there's was accident number one, you know. And then uh, number two was. Um, through that, we met our lifelong instructor because he was teaching the man who taught us at the time, hmm. John Hassett, who lived a little further away. He was about an hour and 15 minutes from us. My mom always said, if he ever comes closer, I'm, I'm going to sign you up there. Just such a great man. We need you to be around him. Hmm. And like a year later, he bought his school about 15 minutes from our house. Like, well, there's yeah. weird accident number two. And then yeah. uh, from there on out, I was hooked. Now, uh, the first six to 16, I had no gold medals and nothing but participation medals. And, uh, People genuinely think that was like, oh, you're saying that to make a good story. Like, no, it was awful. Like, when I go home and see those guys, they laugh because they'll be like, man, like, you had no business sticking with this. Like, what is wrong with you? And uh, yeah, just uh, I've been hooked on it ever since. I loved it. And uh, I think it was because of the people we were around, too. We had really good instructors and teammates, and it was great. How do you feel like that shaped you just even as a young boy, kind of into your young manhood, just having a, a consistent place where you're learning discipline? and getting control of your emotions, like all those kinds of really great principles that they're teaching. Absolutely. I, I think it was huge because, you know, I was saying it before to somebody else. I mean, my mom were talking about this recently before my fight, we were kind of like reflecting on like how life goes full circle. And, yeah. um, you know, my instructor, John Hassett is a great man. He's a great husband, great father. He's got four kids and he, you know, he's a lifelong believer and he, he's very vocal about it in the school. And as much as that could, you know, defer business sometimes or, he never cared. You know, he was very open about, he yeah. always stood his ground on what he believed in and uh, always shared it with us. And it's great because, you know, when you're a kid, I think you leave, ho leave home and, you know, it's not the cool age to listen to your parents as a boy, as a young man from like 10 to 16, you're kind of, okay, yeah, you're my dad or you're my mom. Yeah. You want me right. to do good in this and that, but they did such a good job of putting me around role models where you're like, well, this isn't my dad or mom. This is my instructor. He's cool. You know, he does jujitsu. Mm -hmm. He's cool. And, uh, he was saying the same things that I would be told at home, but I didn't even realize that until later yeah. on in life, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think that was just amazing of them to trust me and to be willing to give up the glory of being like, well, I'm your dad. I want to be your favorite role model. Like, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about how tough this guy is and right. how funny Mr. Hassett is. And instead, they're like, yeah, you need to go more. Okay, here, here's money for a tournament. Or we're paying your tuition or mm -hmm. we're driving you after work all day. And uh, so I think between my family and the people at the gym, and the other great thing was, from about eight years old, I was in adult class because jiu-jitsu was not a kid's sport back then, you know? Mm. And uh, it was amazing getting around those guys because now my peers are now adults and you're talking to these people and they're talking to you like your opinion's worth something, even though I'm 10 or whatever yeah. I was. I think I learned how to be an adult and a man really early on being around other adults and men and doing the same activities as them. And then having the option to really see for myself, okay, well, I want to be like this person. I mean, I don't want to be like that person, but... Uh, it was kind of like I would leave school where I get to be a kid and have everybody telling me what to do all the time. And then I go into this place of free will where it's really a test of what I'm being taught at home and, and by my mentors. So good, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about putting my son in. He's, he just turned nine, which I think is about that age where that's great. Yeah. That age is about where like you start introducing them to other influential voices that you think that you respect, you know, cause dad has been saying the same thing for nine years, you know, but when, when your instructor says something or a teacher or a coach or mentor or whatever says something it seems to just hit differently. And just, this is a little bit of a side tangent, but uh, I was just thinking for all the parents who now have to homeschool because of all the stuff that's going on right now, like one of the reasons we've actually been homeschooling for years. And one of the reasons we chose to homeschool was because you could kind of pick and choose who you want your kids to socialize with. And it's the exact, like, we do uh, homeschool for the exact reason that you just described, like uh, putting you around other adults where you you kind of have to mature quickly and you have to have to learn how to have these like adult conversations, which for us, it was like socialization. When you put your kids in school, they're talking to a bunch of like snot nosed other yeah. eight year olds, yeah. but, but you can have the choice where it's like, no, I want you to go be around these adults. And anyway, I think that's a We've benefit been... that most people don't think about we've been talking about the exact same thing with everything going on and uh, you know, with the child on the way and just thinking about, especially in 2020 being Christians and certain view, you know, things are getting pushed out of the schools that were a no brainer years yeah. ago. And now I think, I think that's exactly right. Is getting them around like-minded people and like-minded other children that are being raised the same way. And uh, I have quite a few friends who are doing that. Uh, yeah. And it seems to be amazing. You know, it seems to really work out. Yeah. You're in North Carolina, right? Yes, sir. Yep. 
Uh, that's such a beautiful area. Has that been home for you for a long time? Uh, North Carolina for three years, South Carolina before that for about uh, six or seven years. And then I was born and raised in New Jersey, so I couldn't get any more opposite uh, than where we live now. Yeah. I love the Carolinas. Beautiful. We just did a dad tired conference out in Raleigh, right? Like that was the last one we did before. Actually, I remember I was in a hotel room. A friend called me. uh, I was about to go speak and he was like, Hey, let's get together. It seems like things might be getting weird because there's a COVID thing or, you know, it was just like, it was that week. And then that's when everything shut down. But anyway, I love the Carolinas. It's, they're beautiful. Uh, how far along is your wife? You're like due soon, right? Yeah. So it's so funny because I left and I was like, I think my last thing I said was like, please hold that baby until I get back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got back Sunday and then uh, Tuesday I was back training and everything. I got to wrestling practice and she called. She's like, I'm at work. I think I'm having contractions. Um, they're not going away. I'm going to go to the hospital. So I went and met her there. She is technically now in early labor, just meaning I get, I, again, I'm not the most <laughs> informed on it's the, all, it's all pregnancy new. Yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so apparently when they say babies come when they come, like that's not just an expression. They meant it. Cause they're like, yeah. you're in early labor. So go ahead and go home and we'll see you maybe tonight or maybe in two weeks. And I was like, wait, what? They're like, I know. Oh yeah. Babies come when they come. We can't predict this. And I was like, Oh, so early labor means nothing, but so now literally any day or any second on the due yeah. date. Yeah. So yeah. the anticipation has been fantastic. Uh, I'm like a, you know, with our training, everything, we're so scheduled and we're so, I'm so type A of like, I want to control everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard for me to understand something like that, but uh, luckily life has made me learn <laughs> to let go a little bit, but uh, it's, yeah, I can't wait. You said you're introvert and you said you're type A and you said your wife is extrovert. Uh, how long, you, how long have you been married? So we have been married two and a half years okay. and together for five as of like last week. So oh, wow. congratulations, yeah. man. So Thank tell you. tell me like, where have you guys butted heads on that personality difference? I think we have a perfect yin and yang thing going. Yeah. Uh, we've never really, the only time we ever butt heads is if I'm trying to leave somewhere and I know it takes her an easy one hour to say goodbye to everybody she's going <laughs> to say goodbye to. Yeah. Like I have no problem if somebody says like a neighbor or something, I got to go to the gym or whatever it might be. And they're saying, you know, how you doing? I have no problem saying, great, thanks. How are you? And then moving on. Right. My wife will have a full conversation and then she'll come in and be like, oh yeah, I don't know how we got to talking so long. I'm like, I do. You <laughs> yeah. add something every time. I ask you one question, but uh, she's perfect because the things that bother her never bother me and vice versa. Yeah. Like, I'll never send anything back in a restaurant or, you know, complain about things to like, I just, I'll go, I'll, I'll internalize it and sit in the car and drink the coffee they got wrong and be like, I can't believe I'm drinking this. <laughs> She'll be like, uh, excuse me, like this yeah. is not what we ordered. Speak so up for something. We kind of yeah. have a perfect balance. That, that's a, it's great when you know it, like when you know those differences and you can like recognize, okay, she's totally opposite than me, but we compliment each other. Yeah. That's awesome. But I always say, cause my wife and I are the exact same way. We were complete opposites, but dude, that's a big gulp of water. That's a big drink. How much water <laughs> yes. do you drink a day? I mean, <laughs> oh, close to two gallons. It's uh, holy cow. how hot it is right now in North Carolina. <laughs> That's amazing, man. And then I, that just sent me on so many other, uh, my ADD kicked in. How, how much weight, weight do you, are you going to cut for like fights? Yeah. So I usually walk around around 175. Okay. Um, and then maybe when we get to fight week, just through diet and the, and the training camp, I'll be down to about 168, 167. And then by the time weigh-in day comes, I'll be about 162. And then I cut the rest in water. So I'll, I'll be water loading all week up to three gallons on Wednesday. And then one gallon Thursday, and then we sweat on Friday. And it's amazing. It's only about an hour and a half tops of sweating in the Dude. sauna, and we're all weight. It's unbelievable what the body can do when you channel it. It's wild. That is incredible. I remember Benil, because Benil missed weight on his last fight. And mm-hmm. he, was, he, he said something in the podcast like, you know, I've got – I had an hour to go or I thought I had an hour and I could cut. I'm like, how can you – bro, I've been trying to cut like a, a pound <laughs> for 10 years now. Yeah. That's I call it a temporary misplacement because it comes yeah. right back the second you sip on that water. It's amazing how fast it comes back on. Interesting. Uh, anyway, I got ADD sidetrack there, but Layla and I, we're, we're totally opposite. And, but one thing that I've always said is like, it's a, it is beautiful when we are walking that line really well, but the line is thin. Like it can go yeah. from like, we compliment each other to like the next minute I'm doing something that super annoys her, or frustrates her and then <laughs> and she, you know, vice versa. So uh, but I'm glad to hear you guys. It seems like you've got a good rhythm going. <laughs> You're close to your parents. It sounds like you've mentioned them a yeah, couple of times. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we went through a time when I started fighting where uh, <laughs> that was probably the toughest time in our relationship as a child and parent, you know, yeah. but um, it's hard to watch your kid pursue something A, that's so dangerous and B, yeah. that's so uncertain. You know, I yeah. always say fighting is not like 
if you're a great baseball player, you pretty much know early high school if you're going to be getting thrown into the colleges or the farm systems, and you know you're at least going to get your education paid for. Fighting is like, it's merit, yes, so it's like a sport, but it's a lot like acting, where you have to wait for these big breaks that mm. may never come. So I mm. think, uh, you know, that tested us. And then, it, like, all the relationships in my life, it seems like fighting has caused them to get even stronger mm. because of the adversity that you always face. Yeah. And uh, same thing, it's the same exact thing. Yeah, we're very, very close. Uh, and it's been, yeah, they've just been super supportive ever since. That's great. And they're still married? Mom and dad are still married? Oh, for goodness, 1982, what are we? Was that, was that 38 years? 30, years? 38 years. 38, 38 years. years and yeah. together since they're 15. Dang. So, uh, so you yeah, watched that. I had, yep, my entire life. And uh, it's amazing too because they still, they still date. You know, they still go out. Even mm. when we were kids, like they always had one day a week at least. And then we always did stuff as families. But, you know, it's always watching my dad get the door for everybody, you know, but especially my mother. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Our, our pastor talks about it all the time. when A lot of, a lot of days when uh, the past couple of years on Father's Day, he's going to good like you know father's day sermons and stuff but he always talked about how you know if his kids were ever disrespectful to their mother he would say yes that's your mother you need to respect her but that's my wife you know yeah. and that's kind of what i've always seen my father do you know is, mm. uh and, and my mother too has been great to my father but just that leader of the household role as far as you know loving god first loving your wife and then loving your children in that order so that we can kind of when all those things are in place it seems like that's when life is just good for sure, dude. That and that's so rare, bro. Like as soon as we hang up, you need to call your dad and be like, Thank you, Dad. Yeah, sure. like, yeah. It's so rare, dude. Like it's hundred so, percent so rare. Um, but I'm glad that you'll never know that. I mean, I, I hope more and more kids will never know that perspective, you know, because that that's amazing. It's uh, funny because I've yeah. seen my father uh, you know, he did really well for himself in life and he just works really hard. And um, mm. some of the guys that maybe were in the same company or something. I didn't know these things until later on in life. I'm like, why don't you go on vacation with the guys that go by themselves or go golfing trips or all this stuff? And, and then I became a man, an adult, and especially in the mm -hmm. industry I'm in, when you see how people behave sometimes and you go, oh, he was sacrificing all that to keep his mm. home life intact. He was, mm. you know, sacrificing a weekend away to be with his family. And, and, and now, you know, like I say, like, you know, backdated a lot, but I'm owing a lot of thank yous for a lot, a lot earlier in life, you know? Yeah. And you for sure will even more, I assume once you become a dad and, you know, you start to step into that role more and more, what do you, what are you excited about? What are you nervous about as you are about to be in dad journey for the first time? I feel like I should be a lot more nervous. I'm not nervous at all. I'm nervous in the hospital room because yeah. I'm not great with, uh, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, professional <laughs> fighter, but, uh, with blood and like, <laughs> you know, anything like that, like, uh, needles yeah. freak me out completely. Yeah. But, uh, Aside from that, I'm just so yeah. Excited. Hold on, let's just pause. Wait. Let's just pause there for a minute, dude. Like that—that's just so funny to me. Like you don't—you don't, don't want to get stuck with the needle, but you'll take a punch to the face, yep. and you don't, you don't want to see blood, but you'll—you'll uh, you'll be in an octagon where there's blood everywhere. It makes absolutely zero sense. No. But uh, yeah, in that department, I'm just so excited. I can't wait to just uh, to meet this, you know, to meet this child, and just you know, it's gonna have. And, and I've think, thought about this for so long is like, uh, people are always like, oh, I can't wait to see what features of me it has. But like, I love my wife so much. Like, mm. I used to think about this all the time when we started dating and then got engaged and then, you know, so on and so forth. It was like, man, like, I can't wait till we have a child. Like, I can't wait to see the little mannerisms from her. Yeah. Especially now that it's a little girl that yeah. she's going to get. That are just going to be so funny because my wife does so many funny, quirky things that I think are like adorable on an mm. adult. I'm like, Imagine what a kid doing these things. Like, I just can't wait to see the little things it gets from each of us. And, yeah. Uh, it's just going to be amazing. I can't wait. Yeah, dude. You're, well, you're going to be a great dad. I can already tell that. And I appreciate so, that. Sounds like a great husband, man. Just the, even the way that, and I've heard you even in your interviews with ESPN and UFC and stuff, like the way that you really honor your wife every chance you get is just, that's really admirable, man. I think that if, if guys like listening could pick up any of that, it's just even the, the subtle ways that you honor your wife. I mean, how, when she sees that and hears that publicly, I imagine that, uh, you know, it, it resonates and it translates into deeper ways uh, privately for you guys in your marriage. I yeah, I, I hope so. You know, I think that's really important. And for me, it's really important because, you know, now I found my, my team that I truly believe I'll be with for the rest of my career. But um, you got to break some eggs to, to make an omelet as far as mm. in this sport, especially you get a lot of it's not like other sports where you have coaches that are like, okay, I'm going to this college. This coach is definitely qualified or has yeah. been vetted or, you know, uh, mixed martial arts is, is a really weird, it's, you know, it's, it's an established professional sport, but we're only, uh, the sport's only as old as I am. It, it, yeah. it, you know, it's inception was 1993. So, 
it's still relatively new and uh, you get a lot of people I've been around a lot of people where um, they were in this for the wrong reasons or maybe trying to latch on because they saw some potential success or maybe they were doing things they shouldn't have done and um, so I, I've been through some different coaches and teams and stuff in my career not very many but a few yeah. so the one constant has always been and outside of my career just in my life but uh, the one constant has been my wife you know so mm -hmm. I feel like while it's so important to thank the guys that I'm training under and training with who helped me so much I wouldn't even be still be in the sport if it wasn't for my wife you know and uh, there's so many times where it's just been us and she didn't want anything from me didn't want anything financially I kind of mm -hmm. sat her down on our second date and told her this is what I was going to pursue saw it the entire way you know and I think when someone blindly supports you it's important that she gets recognition and it's yeah. so funny I've had coaches in the past that um, didn't like that in the same post that I'd thank them as I'd thank her as well and uh, was like screaming at me in the gym one night that this you know this girl has nothing to do with your success blah 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 and then when I finally get my big break you know on the contender series I'd say more of the episode was about her than about me so uh, it was fantastic how they I, I'm really glad now they kind of know that that's the direction that I want yeah. Anytime they mention me, I hope they'll mention my family. And uh, they continue to talk about her on broadcasts and stuff. And it's really, really cool to see. Yeah, dude. That's awesome. I feel like I would be really frustrated with that coach if they were if the thing that they <laughs> got upset about was me talking about my wife too much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is she, how does she feel now, like, watching you fight? What's her, what's, how, how nervous is she? I don't think terribly nervous until we walk out, you know? Mm. Um, I know this time she was upset that she couldn't be there because, of, A, the quarantine out there. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people had their families coming out and staying in other hotels, but she's, she was like 35 weeks, 36 right, weeks, so she couldn't right. fly or anything. But um, she's really confident in me, even though when I'm not confident in me. Hmm. Um, I've been around the sport a lot longer. She's been around since I started fighting MMA, but I've been training and watching the sport for 20 years, you know, and uh, I know that, like, the best guy doesn't always win, or sometimes guys just have good nights. Like, I'm nervous for all the variables. She's just like, hey, you work really hard. I'm very excited for you. Like, <laughs> she watches. She gets super excited. She's super into it, and uh, – it's really fun because she, she's like, uh, we figured out how to do this thing together, you know? Yeah. So when I call her from fight week this time and I'm like, hey, I'm, you know, 164 this morning. She'll be like, wow, that's two pounds lighter than last time on this day. Like, she's really got it all figured out with me. Wow. It's kind of funny. Yeah. And uh, it's been fantastic. She, she doesn't, like I said, things that bother her, like losses eat at me, you know, my, my yeah. pride, which is something I try to kill off hmm. uh, and, and not feed into. You know, they would eat at me for so long and, uh, She's like, so what? You go in the gym on Monday. Like, I'm like, well, I made half my pay. She's like, yeah, so what? We'll make more money. Like, wow. the things that bother her don't bother me. And, and it's like that perfect yin and yang. She, she gets really excited. Dude, what a gift, man. Uh, the Proverbs, he who finds a good wife finds a good thing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. amen. Uh, for those of us that have wives like that, it really is. We, we feel that deeply. Uh, dude, there's a lot of professional athletes who are Christian who aren't necessarily excited about using their platform to point people to Jesus. And it seems like every time you have a microphone in front of you, you want to make sure that people know that what's most important to you is your relationship with Jesus. That's just rare too. Like what's your motivation behind all that? Uh, yeah, multiple things, you know, a, a is I really, my, my entire life I've been a believer, you know, but uh, the path that we always took to being believers wasn't always the path that I'm on now, as far as really accepting God's word, Mm -hmm. and looking for people that are going to explain God's word and preach God's word and preach mm -hmm. biblically, you know, yeah. um, I was, I was raised Catholic. So mm -hmm. a much different background. And, you know, uh, I think Benil kind of said it in his interview, he wasn't Catholic, but the kind of church that he was going to, he's like, I didn't really take much from it because right. I, I, know I can only speak for Catholicism. I went to Catholic school and I'm very glad that I did because it gave me structure and uh, you know, it did give me a relationship with Jesus. not the one that I have today, but, but still, a good foundation, yeah. but it's very ritualistic. You know, sometimes you're just repeating things that were taught to you, but you don't know what you're saying because it's maybe an old English or hard to yeah. understand, or it's kind of just like a song and dance. Um, yeah. And the only, the only preaching is only about 10 minutes, you know, and uh, unfortunately because of the, the way that Catholic church lines up sometimes, a lot of times it'd just be the, the priests complaining that we didn't donate enough in the, in the basket, you know, mm. and because uh, mm. it's attached to the school and they need funding for the school and right. uh, things like that. So, but that being said, I always felt a very strong connection uh, to Jesus. I knew Jesus as my savior. It just wasn't taught to me. The, the good side, God's grace wasn't really taught to us. Mm. It was more taught in a fearful manner, you know, which, which mm. is good because it keeps you on the straight and narrow, I suppose. But so then I left, you know, I left high school and uh, we, we kind of didn't really attend church anymore. And I would just say my prayers and that was it. And then as I was training and I was living in Myrtle Beach, I, 
I never really went. I didn't really find a place to call home for church. I didn't really have any spiritual mentors. I would just kind of pray, you know, and I, and I still have my faith, but I wasn't growing. One night in the gym, my buddy, we, his name's Q, uh, really nice guy, really, really supportive friend of mine, just a great guy. And uh, he looked at me in the locker room and was like, hey, like, do you ever use the Bible app? I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't know there was an app for that. Mm-hmm. And he had me download a version, and we got on the same plans. And then I started diving into God's word a little bit. I was like, wow, mm-hmm. like, I, this is different than anything I learned in school, you know? And then through that, uh, my coach now, John Salter, uh, came to teach a seminar at our gym. And I was just blown away by the technique and the, you know, on the MMA side of things. And then I went to his page and then I ended up contacting him and going to his gym. I saw that, you know, he's a very outspoken Christian and every chance he got in the same manner, you know, uh, he would glorify God. And I saw that every time before he fights, he's taking a knee and praying while they're introducing his opponent or himself. Hmm. And he was just such a humble human being and knew what was important, you know, and he had a very good marriage as well, has a very good marriage uh, with his wife who are great friends of ours. So I, I started training here and I said, I knew I would be a better person being around him. I knew I'd grow closer to God. Our first time hanging out together, we went to lunch and he's like, oh, I'm going to say a quick blessing. And mm-hmm. uh, I was like, man, like this is how a confident man carries himself. Like he doesn't know what I believe in. We didn't talk about it yet, mm-hmm. but he knows that he's going to say a blessing before the meal. And if I'm going to be his friend, even if I wasn't a Christian, I'm going to bow my head and, mm-hmm. and, you know, go along with it. And, uh, yeah. As we moved here, you know, we moved here with the goal of getting to the UFC or to Bellator. And, you know, it's very uncertain, especially in my weight class. There's a lot of guys all over the world trying to, you know, 155 is arguably the most stacked division in the world. Yeah. But my wife and I talked about this and something that we verbalized to each other was by going here, we are going to become better people, better Christians, better overall human beings. Mm -hmm. And even if we fail short of our goal of getting to the UFC, we will have a better life. And, uh, Sure enough, our first weekend here, they invited us to church. And uh, that was about almost three years ago now. Mm. And uh, my life changed forever that day. You know, uh, it definitely changed that first day when my buddy got me reading scripture. And then mm. walking into that church was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was, it was a lot to take in. I was thinking like, oh my gosh, are they going to accept me? I, ha- I have tattoos. Oh, are they going to accept me? Mm. I'm, a MMA, I'm an MMA fighter. Oh my gosh. I, sometimes I dress like I'm from New Jersey and we're in the South. And they going to accept me like, yeah. It was so different when I walked in. It was like, oh, like everyone here just loves God. Everyone here mm. is talking about God's grace and how, yes, we all fall short. We're all missing the mark all the time, but we're saved by the grace of God and we're loved by a God who loves us, not just this God that's going to strike us down for being bad people, but yeah. this God that has paid the price for our sins. And I was never taught that. Um, mm. You know, sometimes in Catholic school, I think because they want to make us more disciplined and stuff, they use it, fear as a motivator. Yeah. And, uh, this was so different. This was where I started to make that, make that transition to going, Oh, wow. Like I put a lot of stock into winning and losing some competitive, but it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. You know, obviously it's how I make my living. I want to win. I want to get, but, but that maybe it's not according to God's plan. Maybe when I walk out here tonight, my, my, the way that God's going to use me tonight is to lose and lose graciously. And I have mm-hmm. to accept that, you mm-hmm. know, and, uh, and in other areas of my life as well. But uh, it was just amazing to be around people like that that are like-minded and to continue to grow. And um, it's just been amazing. And since then, uh, recently I was baptized at our church. My oh, wife cool. was as well. Awesome. Uh, we did that alongside each other, which I thought was, was amazing. That's and so uh, cool. the way that they've all embraced us and welcomed us into the church and uh, even like supporting us the other night, messages from some of like the pastors and stuff. And um, that has meant more than anything than a lot of times having even friends in the sport because they just want us to go out there and be good representatives of what we believe in and, and yeah. to go out there and to be good people. And I was talking to my brother a little bit the other day and just where we are in life. Once we accepted God's grace and started understanding what life was about, you know, which is my job is to be, you know, to be a good man, to make sure that I'm leading my family, mm-hmm. you know, to God and that I'm putting out a good example for my daughter and going to lead her, you know, to hopefully then have her family one day and find a man that's going to lead them in that same way. And, mm-hmm. uh, when I realized that, it seems to take some of the stress off of the things that I was worried about that are worldly, like wins and losses and fight purses and things like that. And uh, as soon as I realized that, I was like, my brother was like, man, how'd you feel the other night walking out? And I said, I felt content. I was like, I felt like I was ready to go that night if I had to, because mm-hmm. I'm right with God and I'm right with my family and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in life. And uh, hey, man. it's been a huge journey just thanks to those people really and wow. leading me to God. Wow, dude. That's you. I mean, there's so many things that you just said that are, yes. you know, it's worth taking away. I mean, one, just like the, the eternal perspective that you have there, like even the fact that you're thinking about 
who your daughter who's not even hasn't arrived yet, but you're thinking about her and the generations to come after her. And you're thinking that mindset, dude, like we need more guys in that frame of mind. Cause I mean, you're, <laughs> you're fighting, you're thinking about wins and losses, but um, a lot of guys are thinking about bills for this week, how they're going to pay their mortgage or how they're going to keep food on the table. Uh, all the jobs that they need to work or are they, what are they going to do for their career? All this stuff, like the day-to-day stressors. Um, but man, if we zoom out, like you just said, and like, and we have that eternal perspective, like what am I, what, what is the legacy I'm trying to leave here? Like, what am I actually, what, what am I investing in my kids? that's going to have impact for their kids and their kids and their kids, man. What a, that's a cool, cool Testament, bro. That was really, really encouraging, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate I appreciate that. Yeah. It's just, uh, the last, the last, especially since the, the words, you're going to be a dad mm-hmm. hit me, you know, we, that was something that we had, had really prayed for and really mm-hmm. hoped for. And, uh, and when it, you know, when it, when it happened, I was like, wow, like my life's about to change and I can't wait for this, but now I got to grow into that role. You know, I'm always trying to plan for the next phase of life, yeah. even though life's always going to change. But, yeah, yeah. um, this quarantine was a time to really think about that. And there was a time in the gym where I was like getting stressed because I'm like, I got to win, get this, you know, mm-hmm. in MMA, we, you know, we get our show money, but then when you win, you get the other half of your pay. And, uh, I was stressed about that because the bay, and then finally it was quarantine. I had the time to sit back and really reflect on what's important in life. And mm-hmm. I was like, look, like selfishly, I want to be an MMA fighter. I don't want to get cut from the UFC mm-hmm. because it's what I love to do. But if that's not the plan, if that's not God's plan for my life, then so be it. Like, mm-hmm what am I going to keep clinging to something that isn't meant for me? You know? And yeah. uh, I got into this almost by accident, you know? And, and it's funny. My coach always talks about this, John Salter, you know, like I said, he's a believer. And when I first moved here, my first fight here, I had changed so much and I had gotten so much better. I felt, and I went out and I fought at a local show. I was five and one. And if I went six and one, I think I would have got a shot at a bigger opportunity. And I fought the two best rounds of my entire career. And then I went out in the third round and I planted my feet. They were real heavy uh, from like adrenaline and just squeezing and, uh, I backed up and the last thing he said was move your feet. I heard that. And then I woke up, I got knocked out <laughs> and you know, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me and this and that, uh, you know, it really messed up the trajectory of my career. And a year from then we're in Las Vegas and I won my contract and he sat there and he's like, dude, he's like, that's God's hand in your life. You would have been like, that was the worst day of your life. That was the best day of your life. He's like, mm. after that, you would have got a shot you weren't ready for. And now mm. you're here to do this. Like, everything happens because it's part of the plan. Like just embrace that. And uh, him telling me that has always made me keep that in mind, you know, that, you know, type a, we always grow up trying to control everything and trying to be the, you know, the head and head honcho and be in charge of everything. But we all answer to somebody, you know, one person and uh, it's, it's his will, not ours. Well, you mentioned Benil and that's one thing that stuck out to me uh, when I had him on the show and something sticking out to me, just talking to you is, your guys' uh, ability to really lay down your own will and to trust God and his sovereignty and uh, just say, I'm going to be obedient today, but ultimately God decides what's best and I'm okay with submitting to whatever he wants for that day. And I, dude, that all of us as men need that kind of attitude regardless of our profession. Um, but the UFC geek in me wants to know what it's like to be knocked out. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so what's that so, process like? That's I a weird day at, the, at work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very unique feeling waking up from that. But I saw a meme before about how, about being, being stupid. They said in the meme and I forget what it was, but the way I compared it was, it's the same thing as being stupid. Is when people say it's not bothersome to you. It's bothersome to the people around you. Oh yeah. It's the same thing with being knocked out. Right. It's like, <laughs> it's way more nerve wracking, stressful, heartbreaking for all of your friends and family who came out to see it or, mm. you know, uh, cause you're asleep. You don't know it, you know? And it's the same thing as kind of when you, when, you know, people say when somebody's dumb, uh, you don't know it, you know, you're not right. self-aware. Um, so you just kind of wake up and the referee stand over you. And the first thing I'm for me personally was, Oh man, I, I didn't move my feet. Did I? And oh, then, uh, man. we were in the back room and they were asking me who the president was. This is 2018. And I could not remember. I, I knew, and I said it out loud. I go, it's not Obama anymore. It's 2018. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know. I had no oh, idea where I was, oh, what I was. Geez. But shortly after, it all comes back to you. And I was back in the gym on Monday, just not getting hit. Um, <laughs> but that really cheered a lot for me, too, is like sometimes when you hit that rock bottom, and again, I always say if we all traded our problems in like a poker game, you'd pull yours right back. That's rock bottom yeah. for my career, not for life. But right, uh, right. that was kind of like the worst is over, you know? So then I can go out and fight freely and say, oh, I've been knocked out. It's 
Really not that bad. Okay, I don't, one less thing to be afraid of. So, yeah, really unique feeling, but not too bad all, all in all. Dang, dude. Well, I don't want to be knocked out at my job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, one thing I think might be helpful, we have a lot of listeners who are in similar area geographically uh, who, I'd l- who I'm sure would love to hear what church you're going to. I'm sure that's going to be a question when they hear like, Dude, what, I want to go to a grace-filled church that yeah. uh, you know, is preaching Jesus. Oh, before you answer that, though, I do want to, one other thought I had uh, was how amazing is it that God really drew you back after your upbringing by his grace? And it was yep. his kindness. I, I always think about that verse that says it, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. You were really drawn back into a relationship with Jesus by his kindness and his grace, which is just, uh, that's so God's character. For anyone that's listening, it's just like, man, I can't get close to God. I'm, I'm, I don't have my life in order. It's always God's kindness that kind of woos us back to him, which is a, I love hearing that in your story, but. So yeah, I remember what you're saying. Uh, the the church, what church you go here. to? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, so we go to Scotts Hill Baptist Church uh, okay. in Hampstead or right out in Scotts Hill. And it's been fantastic. You know, we just a great team of leaders there uh, who have just been so helpful in our growth. And it's amazing the, you know, when we were going to become members, we had already been going for over two years. You know, we finally, it took, that's the other thing is, like it took a while to get back into church and yeah. going. It took a while for me to fill out the thing on the back of the, on the car for our note taking that said, I'm new here and yeah. interested in membership about two years, you know? And when we yeah. did, I was like, okay, uh, you know, I still, I came up Catholic. So I was like, okay, is this going to be like some hefty membership fee or where, yeah. where's the, where's going to be that one thing where they get me and I go, Oh, I got to find somewhere else to go. And they're like, no, we just want to meet with you to make sure that, you know, mm. you know, that you know what you're committing to when you come here, which is, you know, that you're going to, you know, live in, in the way, that, you know, and, and come here and not and make sure our expectations are on the same level of right. you're going to come to a church that preaches biblically and, you know, we're all saved by the grace of God. And yeah. that was it. There was no, there was no hidden. There's no oh, small also, print. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's just such an amazing place where, man, the way that they, the things they do for, for uh, the kids programs and everything has been amazing. Um, mm. But like you said, God just draws us back in sometimes is exactly it is. Um, Mm -hmm. I always say this to people is like when, when you're living the way you're not supposed to, it feels like, you know, I, I, again, I always call it God's hand. Um, It feels like life just keeps getting worse and worse and worse as you keep going away from the things you're meant to do. Yeah. And then when you finally just give in to what you're supposed to do, it seems like life just gets instrumentally uh, exponentially better, you know? And uh, that's kind of what happened is I was lost but not doing anything that I wasn't supposed to be doing, just mm-hmm. kind of like a lost sheep out there. You know, I just hadn't found that way. And then, but maybe if I, if I say no to John Salter, when he invites me to church that day, I'm, I'm still lost, you know, and uh, mm. I've always tried to, if it's within the things we're supposed to do, as far as, you know, right and wrong, I always try to say yes to things, even when it's outside my comfort zone, even yeah. if it means waiting two years to check the box of, Hey, I'd like to become a member. I'd watch all these people getting baptized. You know, every, every couple of weeks they'd have somebody, somebody new, and I had been baptized as a baby, but that wasn't my decision, you know, and it wasn't right. my immersion. Right. So every time it would happen, I'd look at my wife and be like, gosh, I, I want to do that so bad. I just mm. don't have the, the courage to ask. And uh, oddly enough, someone who gets up and fights in front of 20,000 people for a living, <laughs> right. getting up in front of, you know, 200 people was like terrifying. And uh, yeah. I waited two years and I finally checked the box and we went through the membership process. And then uh, right before the fight is when I got I was, uh, baptized. It's awesome. funny how it all played out. Yeah. I love hearing what God's doing in your life, bro. Even more in your fights and all the stuff, exciting stuff in, in the UFC, just hearing what God's doing in you, especially as he's preparing you to lead a family and raise a baby girl now. Uh, that That's probably the most exciting thing for me is to kind of watch that for you, man. Me, that's awesome. Yeah, me too. It's the exact same way. And it's funny because like I said, for since I was six, I've been centered around being a competitor and doing this, yeah. you know, and uh, until this year, really, the last two years, but especially now knowing what's on the way for us with the baby and everything is like, uh, you know, it, it's been amazing to see like that pales in comparison to yeah. life, you know, t- fighting's 10 years, maybe 15 years, mm-hmm. but, uh, it was a big ego check for me to understand that it is just my job, you know, and, uh, it might be a cool one. It might be a good platform and that, yeah, I could be out there on top of the cage flexing and screaming and trying to get praise, but that would be so hollow and meaningless, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. I finally started to see that as, Oh, I have a job. I can use it to do, hopefully a couple good things for some others and lead others and hopefully to a good thing. And, uh, that's it. It's not that big of a deal anymore. I love the perspective, bro. 
Uh, I'll give you one piece of uh, dad advice as you're about to jump in. And then I want to end our time with just you encouraging the guys with whatever's on your heart, kind of final words here. But uh, for, I always tell new dads, this is, this was, I wish somebody would have told me this when I had our first baby, but uh, dads typically bond shoulder to shoulder uh, where women or moms will bond face to face. So my wife could just stare at that newborn baby for hours and feel like they were just <laughs> madly in love. And I'm like, well, what do we do? Like, what are we going to do with it? You know, like, let's go do something. Uh, and I loved my son. I was just, you know, I cried, I wept when he was born, but I still like, I felt like I was behind her in the bonding process. She was ahead of me. Uh, and she kept asking me throughout the whole first couple of months. She's like, do you love him? Do you love him? I'm like, of course I love him. You know, she's just like, okay, I really love him. I'm like, so do I, you know, but there's, I just felt like I was a couple of steps behind her. But what I realized for most dads, and this isn't true for everyone, but mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a bonding that, that happens when you actually get to do some, something together. I remember the very first time my son was sitting up and I could roll a ball to him and he rolled it back. <laughs> I was just like, oh dude, like game changer. Now we're going to like do stuff together. Uh, and, and it, it just went to a whole nother level of bonding. So you may, that may be experience. It may not, I don't know, but if it is, if you feel like you're a couple of steps behind your wife, just know, I think a lot of dads feel that way and you're just kind of waiting to like do something with your baby. <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I will need that at some point. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, especially with all the time I miss traveling and training and stuff. I'm like, yeah. I'm sure I'll start feeling guilty about it yeah. and then need to go back to that advice. So that'd be really good. Yeah. yeah man. I appreciate that. Yeah, dude. Any, uh, any final words, uh, for, you know, for the guy that's listening, who's just trying to figure out, man, I want to be a man of God. I, I want to put things into perspective and, and be who God's called me to be. Anything you'd want to say to that guy? Yeah. I think we just have to have the, have the courage and the, uh, you know, the humility to accept it, that that's what we're already called to do, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, I think if I would have realized that a lot earlier in life, I think I'd have been a lot happier a lot earlier in life. And, uh, you know, I, I, maybe that was my path, you know, I wasn't supposed to realize that until later in life. But yeah, I think just accepting, accepting that we're all, we're all, none of us are perfect. Like even getting the, you asked me to come on here, you know, reading about that, uh, you know, what the podcast was about and seeing how big of an audience it had. I was like, oh, maybe I'm the wrong guy. And I was like, well, oh, man. If I'm going to say what, what God wants me to say, then, then I'm not going to be the wrong guy. Same thing with fighting on ESPN or whatever it is. Like, I have all these convictions of being a small guy from a small town or, you know, oh, that one time I, uh, maybe I told a lie or whatever it is. I'm like, oh, I'm, I can't, like, uh, recently, you version, I tagged them in a post when my fight was canceled. The, the verse of the day was something that really hit home with me, and I shared it, and I tagged on my story. And they reached out on their thing. And were like, hey, we'd like you to do an Instagram TV thing, mm. speaking on it. I was like, Oh, I'm like not fit for this. And I, yeah, I said yeah. yes because yeah, it made yeah. me nervous and, and it's my calling. But I think that's the thing is realizing we're all flawed. Uh, I have I have a tattoo on my arm, but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter first, uh, chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, right? Yeah. When Paul's talking about how, you know, he was the worst of them all because he was mm. persecuting Christians. And even God, God even used him and God made him one of the greatest, you know, apostles. Yeah. And yeah. how, uh, you know, and he says it, it wasn't me, but the grace of God. So, we all are saved by the grace of God as long as we accept Jesus. And uh, I think that as long as we accept that, then we can do what we're called to do. And uh, yeah. we're never, we're, we might be, able to be down in a valley, but we're never out. That's a good word, bro. Uh, it, it reminds me that, uh, you know, Christians, just like non-Christians, sin, we're sinful people. We do a lot of dumb stuff. Even today, I'm going to make mistakes and sin. But I think for us as followers of Jesus, it's the way we respond to sin. It's, it's saying, all right, man, I, I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm repenting often and I'm turning to Jesus often, which is what I hear you saying. Uh, dude, this was so good. Oh, I need to make a shameless plug because you brought up you, you version a few times. We do have a dad tired you version devotional on there. If you, <laughs> awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download it right now. I'm telling you that, but I'm also telling the dad tired audience in case they <laughs> forgot. Uh, you guys can download that. That's a totally free dad devotional but bro thank you man thanks for taking the time to hang out it's such an honor i can't wait to watch you uh i'm bummed that you and benil are in the same division because i'm like oh yeah. crap i hope you guys never fight each other i mean i won't <laughs> be able to watch that but uh i'll watch you as you continue to climb the ranks man yeah thank you so much for having me on man i really appreciate it